Good morning. Um, thank you very much for jo joining, 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 join, joining us this morning, 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 morning. Um, um, so, so, um, I'm sorry. Um, so, so, my name's Ale Alex, Ale Alex Barnes. Um, I'm, 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 I'm head, head of, head of insurance at, 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 um, um, and we're we're sort of delighted to to be speak 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 speaking to you I'm sort of um, this, this this morning about, um speaking to you this morning about um 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 I'm um, um, so about after seventeen um I'm I'm I'm, I'm del 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 delighted to be introducing Mark Spencer who who is um a a a a, 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 a really key voice within after seventeen. Within the firm, he, he is also on the FRC's um, ethical advisory group, which looks at IFRS 17, and also on the IFRS 7 discussion group of the ICA double 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 as well. Um, and we've also got Santiago Restrepo, who is an actual director within our team as well. Um, there's a few points of admin. First of all, um, all your lines are going to be muted, but we'd be delighted to have questions. So you'll find there's a Q&A function at, at the base of um, Zoom. Um, so please do do a mute use of that. Um, also, um, please do let us know if you've got any issues with with, with, with the um, um, um sort of um sort of um tech 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 side 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 as well. Um, your 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 your, your um, lines lines will be um, um, will, will um, be, 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 be so your 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 sort of lines will be muted, um, but this will be recorded and the slides will be available later. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. So in this uh, talk, we plan to talk about the background of IFRS 17, the current reporting framework key aspects of the standards, um, some key IFRS 17 di disclosures, which everyone needs to think about, and what insurers need to be thinking about right now and as the projects really get them going. Uh, next slide, please. So the background of IFRS 17, it has taken a very, very long time. IFRS 17 is 20 years in the making, or over 20, 20, 20 years in the making. It dates back to, to um, when Solvency 2 was being implemented as well, or, or, or being, 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 being on that path. Um, it, it, it was um, I'm sort of um, issued in May 2020, so 2017, and was amended um, this, 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 this year. Um, it, it is due, due, due to, to um, really um, place I, 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 SM SM4, which was only ever considered an 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 interim standard, which took allowances of the imperfections across various jurisdictions, um, um, frame 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 of what works. So so didn't seek to amend those. Um, it it is going to be applied for all insurers um that adopt IFRS. And it will be expected in due course to replace FR, 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 S103 as well. It's going to be effective for all years commencing on or after the 1st of January. Uh, there's been a few delays to, 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 to um, um, sort of um, re really, really reach that, 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 that point. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's one year comparatives. So everyone needs 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 to 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 and really 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 think about the restatement of those prior comparatives as well. Um, you can adopt it early, but it's not been endorsed by the EU yet. Um, so if you're in the EU, you can't yet. Um, and there's a two and a half year implementation period, which is unusually long, and that's due to the complexity of the standard. Next slide, please. So why was IFRS 17 developed? Well, firstly, it's because of the lack of useful information for investors, particularly those not familiar with insurance. So insurance was always considered a bit of a dark art. There's a number of factors that 
you've got to know the insurance market to be able to understand. Um, so they want to help encourage investors into the insurance market. Also, there's a lack of transparency on profitability. Um, 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 so, so, we, so, we, so, we, so we will, 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 do different things to um, gen, 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 general insurers and between jurisdictions as well. And there's also an inconsistency com compared with other industries as well. There's a number of practices that are allowed it with 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 them in a, in um, insurance that wouldn't be permitted elsewhere. Um, next slide, please. I think we'll be pa passing over to Mark. Thank you, Alex. Um, as Alex said, IFRS 4 was a stopgap that was drafted as insurance contracts needed a financial reporting standard when IFRS was adopted by the EU in 2005. As you should be aware, IFRS 4 did not prescribe the accounting for insurance contracts, as do other standards, such as IS39 financial instruments, recognition and measurement does for financial instruments. IFRS 4 allows insurance contracts to be accounted for as they were being accounted for as at 2005 onwards. With change is only being allowed if it gave rise to accounting and financial reporting that was more reliable and or relevant, but not less reliable and or relevant. What is on your screen at the moment is a typical income statement that starts with the top line of gross written premium. Gross written premium is the premium that is written in the insurance contract. It does not represent end income or premium received. The manner in which one gets from gross written premium to net end premium is different across insurers. For example, it can include receipt of deposits. More importantly, it is different as to how revenue is earned when compared to other industries. Claims also include payments relating to or refunds of deposits, with lots of aspects being rolled up into claims, reinsurers share thereof, acquisition cash flows, and changes generally in insurance contract related balances. This makes it very challenging to compare and analyze insurers' financial performance, as Alex said at the start. Next slide, please. And under IFRS 4, the balance sheet also includes a number of line items that relate to insurance contract related transactions and balances. These include acquisition costs that have been deferred, premiums receivable, reinsurance contract assets, and a large number of technical provisions, such as claims incurred, incurred but not reported, unearned premium reserve, and unexpired risk reserve. Most of these balances are not discounted. Next slide, please. We will now talk through income statement and balance sheets in an IFRS 17 world. We will do so with IFRS 17's main measurement model in mind, which is quite simply referred to as the general measurement model. Santi will talk about the simplified model that is better known as the premium allocation approach. While we appreciate that a large portion of the insurance contracts written by general insurers will probably be eligible for simplified measurement under the premium allocation approach, we are covering the general measurement model as it is less likely that the reinsurance contracts held or reinsurance contracts written would be eligible for the premium allocation approach in terms of measurement. And remember that under IFRS 17, reinsurance contracts written are to be treated the same way as other insurance contracts written. Also, the standard recognizes that insurers issue a large number of insurance contracts with the unit of account to which the recognition and measurement requirements of the, stand, of the standard are applied, being possibly done so at a group of insurance contracts level. 
Santi will spend some time on requirements relating to group of insurance contracts, but what I'm talking through now applies equally to both individual insurance contracts and groups of insurance contracts. The IFRS 17 income statement looks very different. This starts with a top line of insurance revenue, which is recognized and measured under a more prescriptive principles-based approach that is based on the International Accounting Standards Board model of revenue recognition that is similar to that of IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Insurance revenue represents the earning of premium for insurance risk over the life of the insurance contract. That is to say, it excludes compensation for the time value of money and other financial risk. The expected future cash flows on writing of the insurance contract are discounted to present value and the difference from the premium received is reserved on balance sheet if the insurance contract is profitable. Losses, similar to IFRS 15, are recognized immediately in profit or loss. The locked in profit is then earned on a systematic basis over the life of the insurance contract via reference to the provision of insurance contract coverage under the insurance contract. This systematic basis is one that is quantified in the form of coverage units. So say you have two five-year single premium contracts then each year could be a coverage unit within the group of insurance contracts, which means that there are 10 coverage units in total. Two tenths of the unearned profit is earned each year and reclassified from the balance sheet to insurance revenue. However, if one policyholder were to cease to exist in year three, then in the third year, one would recognize four tenths of the unearned profit, which is the one tenth on the first insurance contract and the remaining three-fifths associated with the second insurance contract, assuming that there is no clawback. This is a very simple illustration of coverage units and Santi will be elaborating on this concept further on in this presentation. Furthermore, changes arising from the discount used at initial recognition due to the existence of the time value of money and other financial risks is not associated with the provision of insurance services and therefore insurance revenue. This is recognized in the new income statement line item that is known as insurance finance income and expense, which sits outside of the insurance service result. This is because the profit that the insurer would earn for the provision of insurance service for insurance risk is to be determined at initial recognition and is to be substantially recognized with all other financial variables held constant. Or, put another way, the margin for providing services under the insurance contract is locked in. The other component of the insurance service result is insurance service expenses. Cash flows that arise in acquiring insurance revenue are recognized within insurance revenue. Cash flows that arise in servicing the claims such as claims handling costs, are recognized with insurance service expense. Next slide, please. An IFRS balance 17 balance sheet has a line item for insurance contract liabilities that are made up of two items. The first is the liability for remaining coverage. This represents the discounted future cash flows for which the insurance service has yet to be provided by the insurer to the policyholder. If the insurance contract is onerous, then on initial recognition, one recognizes the loss immediately in insurance revenue, so as that the discounted cash flows that are on balance sheet represent the amount needed to perform the insurance services to the policyholder. If the insurance contract is profitable, then the difference between the premium and the discounted future cash flows are reserved on balance sheet as the contractual service margin. Debits to the liability for remaining coverage are recognized in profit and loss as the insurance revenue credits to the extent that they relate to the provision of insurance service or cash flows that were incurred in acquiring the associated insurance contracts. 
As I said earlier, the changes in the discount rate are recognized in profit and loss as insurance finance income and expenses. When a claim arises, this is recognized as insurance service expenses in profit or loss and liability for incurred claims on balance sheet. This applies to both claims reported and claims that are incurred but not reported. So the valuation of claims under IFRS 17 does not change in principle. However, if the duration to settlement of those claims is greater than 12 months, then this balance needs to be discounted as well. As a pound settled a year in the future is worth less than a pound today, given inflation and other factors. An asset for remaining coverage and an asset for incurred claims is recognized and measured for reinsurance contracts held. But remember, reinsurance contracts written are included with the liability for remaining coverage and the liability for incurred claims. As one can see, an IFRS 17 balance sheet has less insurance contract related balances on it. However, as we will see later on in this presentation, that is because a large amount of the detail and more detail has been moved to the disclosure notes. One final thought on this slide, financial assets will be accounted for under IFRS 9 financial instruments and not IS39. This is because the effective date for IFRS 9 for insurers is the same as that of IFRS 17. Next slide, please. And this slide brings together what we have been talking about in terms of IFRS 17's general measurement model for insurance contracts written and reinsurance contracts held, which is colloquially known as the building block approach, as it is made up of the building blocks of future cash flows that are discounted, the risk adjustment, and if profitable, the contractual service margin. The discounted future cash flows represent what is known as the loss component. As this is what the insurer expects to lose at initial recognition, but this loss is reassessed each year whereby the outstanding contractual service margin is reduced to zero before additional losses are recognized immediately in profit or loss. The risk adjustment represents compensation to the insurer for its bearing the uncertainty arising for insurance contracts in relation to the timing and amount of cash flows. The more uncertain the cash flows are, the higher the risk adjustment. This is not to be confused with the premium for liquidity which is the time it takes to realize or settle a balance, with such premium for liquidity being part of the discount rate that is the compensation for time value of money and other financial risk. And I'm now gonna pass over to my colleague Santi, who's gonna talk a bit more about the building blocks. However, I'll take a short pause here just to check in with Alex to see if there are any questions from the audience. Alex, do we have any questions from the audience? I'll take. Oh, sorry, no, no, we don't have any major questions right now. So I think I think we just continue right now. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. And Santi, over to you. Hello, everyone. Yes, okay. Thanks, Mark. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on the building blocks that Mark just showed. So first off is the uh, present value of future cash flows. Now, cash flows included in this block should be all insurance contract related cash flows within the contract boundaries. The definition of what an insurance contract is and its contract boundaries is a complex area. And I will not go into the details today, but would caution that the contract boundaries in IFRS 17 are not necessarily aligned with those of Solvency 2. Now, future cash flows within the boundaries are then the premium related cash flows, claims and benefits, expenses, and in expenses you'll need to consider both allocated and unallocated expenses, and these are claims handling expenses, but also fixed and variable expenses that are attributed to fulfilling insurance contracts. Other cash flows here are uh, acquisition costs directly attributable to the portfolio, premium taxes, claimed recoveries such as subrogation and salvage. Now, because acquisition costs are now included in the cash flows, there is no 
deferred acquisition costs as in the current standard. Although acquisition cash flows in respect of future renewals can be recognized as an asset or liability until the company recognizes the contract renewals. Now, the estimate of cash flows should be a, an unbiased best estimate, and that is a probability weighted average of all possible scenarios, which means that for very complex liabilities, there may be a need to use stochastic modeling. Cash flows should also be current, which is they need to be updated to reflect changes in views about likely outcomes. And finally, as Mark mentioned, they should be discounted for the time value of money. The discount rates that you use to, to uh, calculate this discount are not mandated, as is the case in Solvency 2. But however, the discount rates should reflect the nature of the insurance liabilities in terms of risk and duration. They should also be current uh, and market consistent, which means that they should be derived from observable market prices. And very importantly as well, the rate of return on assets should not come into the determination of the discount rates, unless the liabilities themselves are indexed to these, which will be unlikely the case in general insurance. The standard describes two approaches to determine suitable rates, a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach, but I won't go into further details about these approaches as it is unlikely that uh, for general insurance liabilities, you'd have to go into, into, into that level of detail. Um, there might be some instances where you might want to uh, allow for liquidity premiums, et cetera, but given the uncertainty in timing and amount of GI claims, it is likely that a risk-free rate is the one that is going to be most suitable. Next slide, please. Now the risk adjustment. The risk adjustment represents the compensation required by the insurer for bearing insurance risk. This adjustment is currently embedded within the liabilities, but without it being visible to the users of the accounts. IFRS 17 now requires us to make it explicit. It is in some ways the equivalent of the solvency to risk margin or the current margins for prudence. IFRS 17 does not mandate a method by which to calculate such risk adjustment. It will be entity specific. However, if the entity uses a technique other than the confidence level technique, they are required to disclose the details of the technique used and the corresponding confidence level so that users of the accounts can benchmark with other entities. There are a number of characteristics that the risk adjustment should reflect. For instance, Low frequency, high severity risks should have larger risk adjustments than high frequency, low severity ones. Also, similar contracts, but ones that have longer duration should show a higher risk adjustment than those with shorter durations. To make it short, the risk adjustment reflects the appetite of the insurer for insurance risk. And this should be internally consistent across lines of business within the entity meaning that the riskier lines should have higher risk adjustments than the more stable ones. The risk adjustment is expected to be reflected into profit and loss over the life of the risk in line with the exposure. This means that as time goes by, the inherent risk reduces and so should the risk adjustment. So for example, if you have a five-year contract with a tail that extends 10 years from inception of the contract, then the risk adjustment should run off over the 10 years. Next slide, please. The contract service margin is that part of the premium that is not part of the claims and benefits, and that is in excess of the risk adjustment and acquisition costs. It is the other element of deferred profit alongside the risk adjustment. On recognition of the contract, it is effectively the balancing item at inception so that no profit is recognized on day one. <clears throat> it represents the risk adjusted 
unearned profit that will be recognized as the insurer provides its services. It is assumed that the insurance company provides its services while the policy is in force. So for instance, using the same example as before, if you have a five-year contract with a tail that extends 10 years from inception of the contract, then the contract service margin should be recognized as profit over the five years the policy is in force. Now, if, if within that period when the policy is in force, there are changes to the present value of future cash flows in respect of future service, i.e. that unearned exposure, then the contractual service margin will take the hit of that change in the way dampening the impact on the profit and loss. This can obviously only continue until the contractual service margin is exhausted and becomes zero, and any subsequent deterioration in the expected future cash flows would be reflected in the profit and loss. Now, the concept of coverage units is introduced in IFRS 70. And what the coverage units do is that they unitize the contract service margin such so as to identify the portion of the contractual service margin that is to be released as profit during each period. The standard does not specify how to determine the coverage units. And this has had generated some debate. Uh, and this debate is documented on several TRG papers. Next slide, please. Now on to the concepts of aggregation of insurance contracts. In IFRS 17, there are two such aggregation principles. First is the, the aggregation for the measurement of the blocks that I have just described. And the second one is the level of aggregation for the presentation of information in the accounts. So I'll start off uh, describing a bit the, uh, the aggregation principles for the measurement of blocks. So in IFRS 17, conceives a portfolio as a collection of groups of contracts. The groups within a portfolio are formed by contracts that are subject to similar risks and are managed together. Each of these groups consists of contracts that are issued no more than one year apart. The blocks described in the previous slides will be measured for each of these groups that compose the overall portfolio. And there will be three types of groups. There will be onerous groups, unlikely to be, or become onerous, and the rest. And by onerous, IFRS 17 means that the net, cash, net, the net cash flow within the contract boundary, including the risk adjustment, is estimated to be a net outflow. In practice, there is bound to be little distinction between the unlikely to become onerous and the rest buckets in general insurance. But you can create more buckets if you like. Measurement for insurance contracts and outwards reinsurance contracts is to be done separately. And all the considerations that apply to direct business are applied to reinsurance contracts as well with a few exceptions. And these exceptions mainly relate to the uh, onerous onerousness principle and the contract service margin. And there are a number of additional complexities with respect to reinsurance, which we will not cover today, as to discuss these in the detail that they merit would take a considerable time. Now, moving on to the, uh, the principles of aggregation for presentation. Uh, this concept relates to how the information is presented in the notes to the accounts, that is the PL and the roll forwards. The main change introduced in IFRS 17 is that direct business or, or inwards business should be shown separately to outwards business. And that means that you'll have PLs for inwards business, a roll forwards for inward business, and you'll have PLs and uh, roll forwards for that outwards business, that reinsurance that you purchase. Otherwise, there are no additional significant changes between what, what is now required um, uh, and what was previously the case. So the precise guidance is contained in IS-1 uh, and the groups for disclosure should reflect material segments of the business. And these could be either types of contract, say for instance, life, non-life, uh, geographical area, 
and reportable segments. The guiding principle is that aggregations or disaggregations of information should not obscure useful information, either because you're including too, too much insignificant detail or by not including so much detail, you're aggregating items that have different characteristics. And with this, I hand back over to Mark, who is going to go through some of the uh, disclosures in a bit more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santi. Okay. Just trying to get this. Next slide, please. And as Santi said, we are now going to talk through the disclosures that need to be prepared and disclosed in an IFRS 17 set of financial statements. This arises from the fact that the income statement and balance sheet are simpler in terms of presentation. However, the detail then manifests itself in various forms and components, with an insurer needing to collate the data needed and have the systems and processes in place to be able to adhere to the requirements of the standard. So this slide shows the disclosures required for the liability for remaining coverage for existing business. This requirement is to show a roll forward for the change in the building blocks of the present value of future cash flows, the risk adjustment, and the contractual service margin from the beginning of the period to the end of the period. And this is further disaggregated in terms of past service, current service, and future service. Experience adjustments need to be assessed as to whether they relate to past, current and future service. Past and current experience adjustments are recognized in profit or loss in the period in which they arise, while experience adjustments for future services are recognized on balance sheet. An assessment needs to be performed when the experience adjustment relates to both past and future performance or current and future performance, with this being accounted for accordingly. The impact of changes in the present value of future cash flows and the contractual service margin under the general measurement model also impacts insurance, finance, income, and expense. In the case of the contractual service margin, this is because, as said previously, the difference in the locked in discount rate when compared to the current discount rate, that is to say, the accretion of interest on the contractual service margin, is to be reflected in insurance, finance, income and expense, not insurance revenue. While all other changes in financial variables are recognized in insurance, finance, income and expense. It is currently being debated as to whether the need to lock in a discount rate under the general measurement model necessitates, necessitates the need to also lock in all financial variables that are associated with that locked in discount rate when it comes to the contractual service margin. The effect of reinsurance contracts held is to be presented separately, but reinsurance contracts written are treated the same as insurance contracts written. And this means that you can have income in terms of insurance, finance, income and expense, given it is profitable, probable the finance, that the financial variables on a reinsurance contract held will move in an opposite direction to the underlying direct insurance contracts that have been written and subsequently reinsured. It is worth pointing out here that there is a risk mitigation option in IFRS 17 that allows for the unwinding of the discount rate to be recognized in profit or loss under insurance, finance, income and expense on a systematic basis, while all other changes that are in effect unexpected are recognized in other comprehensive income. This decreases the volatility in the profit or loss for risks that are not insurance risk related but financial risk related, and also allows for a degree of symmetry between financial asset accounting if these are measured at fair value through other comprehensive income. This is because under such IFRS 9 classification basis, changes in fair value due to changes on, in rates on said financial assets are recognized in other comprehensive income, with examples in changes in rates being those relating to foreign exchange, interest rate, and credit spreads for foreign denominated fixed rate bonds that are held to the extent that such foreign denominated fixed rate bonds are held by the insurer. The last line of the roll forward represents the cash outflow or inflow during the year 
for existing business, which can be due to either premiums received, claims being paid, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Disclosures and therefore information is also required to be analyzed for new business written during the year and experience adjustments, with experience adjustments taking the form of changes in estimates. And this, with this also including details by the present value of future cash flows, the risk adjustment, and the contractual service margin for profitable and onerous business written during the year, with this being disclosed separately. Changes in estimates also need to be analysed in terms of profitable and onerous business as well, and for future service. Current service recognised in profit and loss needs to be disclosed as well as experience adjustments for past service in relation to claims. Next slide, please. And on current service, this needs to be analysed as well, so the information needs to be available. This is to provide insights to users on what has been recognized in profit and loss, with this being in the terms of the contractual service margin and lapses and adjustments for losses, which goes back to my point earlier of reducing any unearned contractual service margin when losses deviate adversely. Next slide, please. We have been speaking about insurance service results for a fair bit, but we will now turn our attention to insurance finance income and expense. And in a similar theme, a lot more information needs to be disclosed in the financial statements. As I have said, under the general measurement model, interest on the contractual service margin accretes to constant rate. Insurance revenue is recognized using the locked in discount rate that was measured at initial recognition. The difference between the locked in and current rate is this interest accretion and is recognized in profit or loss as part of insurance finance income and expense. This is the financing of the insurance contract by the insurer to the policyholder. Given the time value of money and other financial risk does not relate to the provision of the services vis-a-vis -vis the coverage covering of the insurance risk. Furthermore, as I again said earlier, assumption changes in terms of time value of money and financial risk from that which was expected and that which was observed can either be recognized in insurance finance income and expense or other comprehensive income. With this being an accounting policy choice, the outcome of which if applied is that volatility due to financial variables is reflected in other comprehensive income and not profit or loss with only the accretion of the interest at the locked in discount rate being recognized in profit and loss. Insurance finance income and expense needs to be analyzed by estimates of the present value of future cash flows and the contractual service margin. The risk adjustment affects insurance revenue as it is a direct effect of the uncertainty in the timing of the insurance related risk related cash flows with this being more uncertain, depending on the nature of the insurance risk and the insurance contract duration. Please remember that under the general measurement model, it is still being debated as to whether the locking in of the discount rate requires locking in and therefore tracking of all financial variables that are factored into the estimating of that discount rate. With such variables, financial variables, including interest, inflation, and foreign currency, amongst other areas of financial risk that may influence the insurance contract written. Next slide, please. Cash flows also need to be analyzed in terms of how they flow into the estimation of insurance contract related balances. For example, premiums received with IFRS 17 distinguishing between the treatment of premiums received and receivable. Another example is claims paid, which also includes the payment of other benefits and associated cash flows incurred in paying those claims and benefits, as well as insurance acquisition cash flows that are associated with the obtaining of the premiums. These cash flows flow up 
into the estimation of the liability for remaining coverage and liability for incurred claims, and into the asset for remaining coverage and asset for incurred claims when it comes to reinsurance contracts held. The fulfillment cash flows are the discounted expected cash flows, which also includes consideration of the risk adjustment and acquisition cash flows. The contractual service margin is the difference between this and the actual premium received if the insurance contract is profitable. Next slide, please. This slide is just to remind you that insurance service result disclosures need to be analyzed by insurance revenue and insurance service expenses. While insurance contract balances need to be analyzed in terms of liability for remaining coverage and liability for incurred claims. With reinsurance contracts held, being disclosed separately, as is insurance finance income and expenses. Some additional thoughts on disclosure are, on reinsurance contracts held, it is being debated as to whether allocated reinsurance premiums can be presented together with insurance revenue and recoveries together with insurance service expenses from the underlying issued insurance contracts or as a single line in the income statement. It is also being debated as to whether non-performance by reinsurers is financial risk or not, and therefore whether it is to be presented in insurance revenue or insurance finance income and expenses. This is because non-performance is being seen as being specific to the parties and this being highlighted separately from financial risk in part of the standard, but being part of financial risk in other parts of the standard. Furthermore, the treatment of disputes is also being debated. Given IFRS 17's requirements on initial recognition, there is also debate as to whether there is a requirement in IFRS 17 to present pre-coverage liabilities together with insurance contract liabilities. And this is because IFRS 17 has requirements on when insurance contract liabilities are recognized in terms of the policyholder being covered, the premium being due, or the insurance contract being onerous. With an insurance contract liability only being recognizable at the earliest of these three dates. Next slide, please. This slide just summarizes what we have been talking through over the last five slides or so. However, one also needs to reconcile the liability for remaining coverage in terms of the cash flows, excluding the loss component and the loss component. And as one can see, there is a large number of reconciliations that need to be prepared under the general measurement model and an insurer needs data, systems and processes in place to deliver this. And at this point in time, I will hand back to Santi for him to provide a few more insights. Santi. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, so next slide, please. So I'll, uh, I'll whisk through the uh, premium allocation approach. The uh, premium allocation approach is a simplified model for eligible insurance contracts only. To be eligible, the contract needs to have, or the contract needs to have coverage period of one year or less, or, the premium allocation approach can be shown to represent a reasonable approximation of the general model. The liability for remaining coverage is, will be something similar to what we now see as UPR minus deferred acquisition costs. So something we can all relate to. And there is further good news, which is that the liability for remaining coverage earns as revenue in a similar way as in the current standard, that is, in a straight line or in relation to the expected timing of incurred claims. And the IASB has included the premium allocation approach in recognition that for general insurance contracts, the analysis of unearned profit locked in new business is less important than for life insurance contracts. Under the premium allocation approach, you will also have additional choices. So you can opt out of discounting the liability for remaining coverage, but only if at contract inception, the time between providing each part of the coverage and the related premium due date is no more than a year apart. And the other option is that you can also opt out from discounting the liability for incurred claims, but only if claims are paid within a year of them being incurred. Next slide, please. So the premium allocation approach is a simplified model, mainly because the contractual service margin is not a consideration. 
and there is no need to disclose fulfillment cash flows and risk adjustment for future service. However, there is still a need to identify onerous groups of contracts, and this necessarily means that an estimate of the fulfillment cash flow still needs to happen behind the scenes, because this is how the test of onerousness is defined. The liability for incurred claims is the same as for the general model, and that is, it is at discount, it needs to be discounted, it includes a risk adjustment, and is the present value of all future cash flows shown at the best estimate basis. And still, the, the, the requirement to separate inwards business from uh, outwards reinsurance still applies, and all the difficulties with reinsurance contracts remain. Next slide, please. And even if the premium allocation approach is a simpler, a simpler model than the general model, there, there is still considerable disclosure required. For example, this, uh, the, the revenue and expense reconciliation, you'll still need to do that, even if you use the premium allocation approach. Uh, naturally, the roll forward that bridges the insurance contract liabilities between periods via the changes in the building blocks is no not required under the premium allocation model. So now I'll hand back to uh, Mark and Alex for some closing remarks and then we move on to questions. Thank you very much, Santi. Next slide, please. The slide summarizes most of what we have been talking about. On reinsurance contracts held, what I would like to say is that an exception to the general measurement model is that a gain on a reinsurance contract held can be recognized in profit and loss upon initial recognition to the extent that it is not greater than the loss on the underlying direct insurance contracts written, with a loss recovery component being recognized for reinsurance contracts held. However, this loss recovery component is still estimated based on the reinsurance contracts held contractual terms. That is to say, only in relation to the risk that it covers vis-a-vis -vis the, the underlying direct insurance contracts written that is associated with it. Another point on reinsurance is that premiums that are not yet due, but relating to past service, are to be recognized in insurance service expense, given they form part of the liability for incurred claims to the extent that insurance services have already been provided. Or, put another way, they follow the associated cash flows that have been recognized in insurance service expense. Finally, on reinsurance contracts held, a high degree of judgment needs to be applied when following the premium allocation approach for said reinsurance contracts held. On acquisition cash flows, what I would like to say is that these need to be deferred if the contract's duration is more than a year or the general measurement model is being applied. These can be expensive and cared under the premium allocation and the duration is less than a year. They can also make group of insurance contracts onerous as they form part of the future cash flows. Also, with the June 2020 amendments, acquisition cash flows need to be deferred, unless, as I said, the duration of the insurance contract is less than a year and the premium allocation approach is being applied to said insurance contracts. These deferred acquisition cash flows represent an asset on balance sheet that need to be allocated to renewals on a systematic basis and also be tested annually for impairment. Not unsurprisingly, the allocation of acquisition cash flows to groups of insurance contracts based on renewals and the application of the impairment test are judgmental in nature and areas of debate. Next slide, please. And I will now hand back to Alex. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, um, so what do insurers need to, to um, really think about? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to just make sure everyone's got the right training. This is a phenomenally complex standard. Um, 
and everyone's got to get used to it. Both the accountants, the actuaries, those those charged with governance, stakeholders. So training is essential. Gap analysis. Um, a lot of um, right now, a lot of the regulators are 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 are, are, are sort of um, really really asking for these gap analyses, um, and that's absolutely essential. Um, um, I mean, ultimately, you can have multiple gap analyses because I think there's various aspects to to, to really think about, particularly data. Um, um, and then impact assessments uh, to understand what the financial impact is going to be, any tax impact, various other factors. And then you want to you you really want to develop your yours and methods. It, it, it is the um um, um build, build, build 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 building blocks approach or the or the, or the um, um sort of um, um sort of um really the the um simplified approach. Then the charge part of part of accounts needs 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 to be to be drawn up. Of data essential reporting engines making sure it interacts with with them so sold 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 um and and then as i said before governance structures risk management your numbers are going to be changing so it's important to react to it um and then what tools you plan to to really use and then importantly, the disclosures are extensive. So you need to make sure all of those plug into something that's going to make sense in your financial statements. And then it's, it is important to have a dry run. This will be complex. So waiting is not a good idea. Uh, if you just move on, Lon. Um, yeah, so, so really, it really is important to get your act um, really for the really for the accountants and the actuaries to work very 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 closely on this. Um, no accountants would have been trained for this um, before now, so it is important to get that tra training in place, the systems, the data, the governance. So, um, and then next slide, please, Lon. Uh, so this just recaps um, um, some key bits of each of the standards, though. So the current IFRS, um, then the um, um, the the sort of building blocks approach, and the and the um, prem 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 allocation approach. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we, we've we've got quite a lot of resource on it, so please do do um, use our our website. Um, we we've got best fact sheets on the, on, the, on this, um, and um, do feel feel them um, free 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 to give 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 us a 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 call if you 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 um um I'm sort of um really really got 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 some um, any any um questions about it, um because I imagine the next few years are going to be quite busy, um. And if you just move on to the next slide, on. Um, so this gives a few contacts within the firm, and I'll just go through the Q and A now as well. So we've got a few questions that 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 have that have really come come on through, um, and just thinking about um, I'm, I'm so so I'm I'm so so I'm just thinking first about the discount rates. We've been asked whether the solvency two discount rate can be applied for IFRS seventeen calculations. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to provide some thoughts on it for Santi to then answer. Um, to put this into context, I mean this is an area of debate because under IFRS 17 there is there are two approaches to estimating discount rates. The first is the top down, and the second is the bottom up. Now the bottom up, what that what that is based on conceptually is you take the most representative risk-free rate um, and then you adjust it for other factors such as um, inflation, such as um, currency risk, such as the duration in which it takes to settle the contracts. Um, so, so, I mean, it depends in terms of how representative that risk-free rate is. Um, however, it is being debated in practice whether a solvency two rate, such as the solvency two volatility adjustment, would be appropriate under IFRS 16 and whether that adheres to the principles of the standard. So that is very much an area of debate that is currently being discussed um, by insurers and professional services firms. And then on the top-down approach, 
what you have is you would determine a reference portfolio of assets which best match your um, insurance contracts um, and then you adjust it for credit risk because the credit risk is not in the insurance contracts but it is in the assets. Santi, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, so, so I, I would add that, um, so the solvency two rates that are provided by AOPA, they are their swap rates, they are basically risk-free rates in each of the relevant currencies. So if you discount each of your, your liabilities in each of those currencies or allocated to those currencies with those rates, would potentially be, be a, a bottom-up approach if you think that um, your liabilities are very liquid, uh, and uh, very uncertain, and therefore you don't necessarily need to add any, let's say, premiums onto that. Onto that, uh, premium is a, is a is a word here that I'm using with two different meanings. But the um, you don't need to add any liquidity premium or or anything to that rate. So I, I wouldn't say that the solvency to uh, interest rates are definitely not allowed you would need to, to justify why they are uh, applicable. And yeah, there could be areas where they perfectly could be, could be allowable and areas where they perhaps wouldn't. So. Yeah, I, I, think, I, th I think that's right. And I think it's an area that um, you kind of need to form a view on. I would advise an insurer to form a view on as quickly as possible and then discuss it with their auditors. But I am aware in practice, that more and more general insurers are using top-down approaches rather than bottom-up. Fantastic, thanks, Mark. Um, the the, the um, next question, for general insurance companies with, with uh, one-year contracts, would the risk adjustment include IBNR? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, again, happy to take that first. I mean, I think the thing that comes to my mind is under IFRS 17, you have the liability for remaining coverage and you have the liability for incurred claims, which make up your insurance contract balance. And I mean, you would use, you would discount the liability for incurred claims if it was greater than a year, um, if the settlement was greater than a year, and you'd also factored in the risk adjustment for the uncertainty and the timing and the amount of the cash flows. So I think IBNR is something other than the risk adjustment. I mean, IBNR would be part of your, liability for incurred claims under IFRS 17, which would include the risk adjustments and also need to be discounted if it's tailors longer than a year. Santi. Yeah, so the, uh, well, it depends on what your IBNR currently includes, right? So if it's um, um, a very prudent IBNR or, or if it isn't. So under IFRS 17, you would go to get a best estimate of your, or, of, of your claims. Yeah. Uh, and translate that into cash flow. So those cash flows that you have the best estimate would necessarily include a portion of incurred but not reported because they're deemed to be the cash flows that you're going to pay almost on an ultimate basis on that, that what you have already earned, let's say. Um, so um, in that sense, the risk adjustment is on top of what you think is your best estimate. And um, it is, it is probably, you can think of it as a buffer or that, mar or that margin that you currently hold uh, that is now going to become visible. Uh, sometimes people can call that IBNR, <laughs> but uh, if you stick to the definitions, it is technically not IBNR. It is just uh, an addition to your, what you think is your best estimate of claims. Fantastic. Thanks. 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 Thanks, thanks, thanks guys. Um, um, just one quick question, um, because time is now run, running, running out. Um, Mark, how's the endorsement process going? Um, a good question. I mean, as things stand at the moment, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group has issued its draft endorsement advice. And that is being issued for comment um, within the EU. And that draft endorsement advice will then be finalised. There is a degree of uncertainty as to whether the final advice will fully support IFRS 17 being endorsed as is. Um, based on this endorsement advice, the European will then make a decision. 
but there is no indication of timings on the European Financial Reporting Advisories Group's website as at this point in time. And the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group is the body within the European Union that, that provides advice to the European Union, the Troika, um, sorry, the Council, Commission and Parliament as to whether they should endorse IFRS. Having said this though, remember, with effect from 1st January 2021, given Brexit, as things currently stand, the UK will need to endorse IFRS 17 for use within the UK itself. And the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, which may be known to you as BAYS, and the UK Endorsement Board are working on this. Fantastic. So, so it um, sounds like it's still going to be a AM a, 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 a path, path to really complete. Yeah. Um, or, or until it FR, 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 S103 goes at least. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's the final words that I have for anybody joining today is thank you for joining us, but it's still an area to watch, try for S17. As you can hear, as you can see, there's a lot of debate. Um, plan, implement, um, and at some point down the line, once IFRS 17 has been implemented around three years later, I would expect to see some form of change to FRS 103, um, because the FRC or whatever bodies in place then would look to apply parts of IFRS 17 under UK GAP. Fantastic. OK, well, um, thanks every, 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 every one for, for joining us this morning. Um, and um, many, many thanks to uh, Mark and Santi for, 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 um, for, 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 uh, um, presenting. We are going to send around the, um, slides and the, um, um, link to the, um, um, sort of, um, web, web of link as, as well, as well, as well, as well, as well. Um, so many thanks all. Thank you.